So, I thought I'd coin an expression for you guys. It's called t tutorialist block. Hello once again everyone and welcome back to Let's Create. So in today's episode, we're going to be doing power-ups. This is something a couple people have requested, so I'm mainly going to be focusing on how to make the player um, become stronger with a power-up or weaker if he takes damage. Um, and we're going to be putting a huge amount of focus on kind of automating that process. So I'm starting with a blank project here. I'm going to be rushing through some kind of player movement. I'm not really going to be explaining a lot. That's because I've done it in other tutorials or there's plenty other online. So if you're looking for player movement, I'm not really going to be paying much mind to it. Anyways, to start, we're going to make two sprites. We're going to make a... or three sprites, sorry. We're going to make a player. And we'll make an image for that. Go ahead and we'll make just a blue square. That will do nicely. Okay, and we're going to copy and paste it over. And then we're going to make a red version of that blue square. We're just going to color it over. Okay, we're going to create a sprite wall. Go into this. Just make it black and fill it. That works fine. Okay, and then we're going to make a power-up sprite. So I'm going to abbreviate that to just power-up. Like PWR-up. Okay, now hit a new sprite button. We're going to make it 16 by 16. Go into it. And we're going to make the first one. Just like so. Just a blue ball. Copy and paste that over. And then make this one a red ball. Like so. Awesome. Now just remember to hit center, okay? You want to center the orange point on 8x8. Eight eight. This is important with uh, how we're going to be testing which object we run into. Okay, so go ahead and save. And now we'll create some objects. We're going to make object player. Of course, and assign it the player sprite. We're going to make object wall. Assign it the wall sprite. And we're going to make object power up. And assign it the power up sprite. Perfect. Okay, so now we can go into a room. Make room underscore 01. I'm going to make it 640 by 480 with 60 frames per second being the goal. Go ahead and place our object in there. I'll put some walls around really quick. Do do do. Okay. And I'll put some random power ups kind of laying around. Okay, so currently our game doesn't really do anything. Let's get to that. So we're going to make a create event for the player. We're going to go ahead and we're going to add some code. We're going to set image speed to zero. So this is because we have two frames in the sprite player. Yet both of them are just going to be for power-ups. So we want to make sure that the first frame immediately stops. So it doesn't keep flashing back and forth. Otherwise... It'll look quite bad, and we have no control over a sprite then. Okay. We're going to make some variables. We'll set hispa equal to zero, vispa equal to zero, grounded equal to zero. So, so far we have our basic variables from our, my usual game maker tutorials, and now we're going to add a new one. We're going to make a power-up one. We're going to call it state equals zero. Okay. So I'll explain state as we go, but we need to make the player move first. So create a step step event, add some code, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to make some variables first. We're going to have to make the keyboard controls. So I'm going to go ahead and do keyboard check direct for all of these. I'll just make them my WASDA keys as I tend to prefer them. Okay. So make that D and make that W. And then we just make sure it's key right and key up. Okay. So if key left is returning true, then we want to set hispa equal to negative 2 as we're moving to the left of the screen or closer to the edge. We're then going to check if key right is equal to true. We're going to set equal to 2 as we're moving away from the start of the screen. Now we're going to check if the player is not pressing any keys at all. 
or if they're pressing both keys at the same time, then we want the object to not move at all, as that would get confusing or otherwise just annoying, really. So we'll say hey, display equal to zero. We can check collisions. So if place meeting x plus hispa, y object wall. Wow, not place meeting. X plus sign of hispa, which of course, as I tried to explain earlier, returns on object wall here. So sign hispa returns a 1, negative 1, or 0, depending on what the value of the variable we're checking is. So in the case of hispa, if it's equal to negative 2, it's going to return negative 1. If it's equal to negative 17.5, it's going to return negative 1. Um, if it's equal to positive 17, it will return 1. If it's equal to 0, it will return 0. And then we're going to set hispa equal to 0 because we're colliding with the wall. Okay, then we just want to add the value of hispa to x at all times. Good, so that's horizontal movement done. Now we'll go on to vertical, so if not grounded, hispa plus equals 0.35, which is just what I prefer for gravity, so that's gravity if we're not touching the ground. We should be falling. Okay, so if key up and grounded. So if we are touching the ground, we want to be able to jump, but only if we are. This bit equals negative 9. That's what I'll do. And we'll do if place meeting for collisions. X, Y plus Vispa, object wall. Okay. Wow, not place meeting. Y plus sign his bow or Vispa, sorry, once again. Wall. And then once again, Y plus equals sign of Vispa. Now we're also going to say if sign Vispa equals equals 1, meaning if it's returning a 1 because the ground's below us, we want to set grounded equal to 1 because the ground's below us then. We always set Vispa equal to zero. And if we're not touching the ground, then of course we want grounded equal to zero again. Okay, now just with y plus equals Vispa, we can go ahead and say, right, that's all of our movement code done. Nice and fast, right? Get out of the way. And now if we move around, awesome. We have these very um, seizuring power-ups. I kind of feel bad for them. There's some kind of horror going on. Okay, we'll stop that right away. I'm getting freaked out. Alright, so we need to get to the power-ups. Before I get into the player's power-up stuff, as I was about to do... Foreshadow... Okay, we're gonna go ahead and go into object power-up, and we're gonna set that up first. So we're gonna do a create event, add some code, and in there we'll do image speed equals zero, once again, and then we're gonna set a variable called power-up underscore type and we're going to set it to i random underscore range of one or two so what i random range does is once again we'll go into here is it returns a whole number between the value of number one and the value of number two it can also return the value number one and the value number two itself so in our case we're getting it to return one or two just like one of those randomly Okay, so with that in mind, we can then go ahead and go into our power up and do add event, a step event, step step, and we're going to do image index equals power up underscore type minus one. So because our value of power up type is one number above what our sprite index is already, power up type of one will equal image index zero. Power up tape of 2 will equal image index 1, which is pretty obvious to understand here now. So that generates the power ups randomly for us. This is very handy. So now we're going to go back into our player. So we got the power ups pretty much set up to randomly generate so that it's kind of interesting. Alright, and what we're going to do is we're going to go if place meeting x, y, object power up. Then we're going to initialize some variables. We're going to make var inst. 
Then we're going to set it equal to instance place of x, y, and object power up. So the reason for this is that instant place actually returns the value of the instance's ID. So how GameMaker defines objects is that when you are defining an object by name, if you have like multiple of them on the screen, it's not going to know which one you're referring to when you ask it to do something, right? You can't really expect it to. However, each object is automatically given an ID. Now that identifies the exact thing. So if we check for a collision with that object at a specific point, we can get its ID, set it to a variable, and do what we'd like. So in this case, we're going to set a variable of t equal to, in brackets put inst. This is important because the variable ID is a bunch of numbers, so therefore it could be referred to as a decimal if we don't put it in brackets. And we're going to set it to dot power up type. So now we're getting the power up type of the exact instance that we touch, right? Okay, and then we can just do with inst instance destroy because we no longer need it. We can actually also do we'll do score plus equals a thousand. So that at all times when you get it, even if you don't really get anything out of the power up, you get score for it. That's just that's good game design right there. It feels awesome, right? It feels really good. Okay. So now we're gonna be doing a new type of statement. This is called a switch statement. So the switch statement allows us to check a number of things based on one particular input. So in this case, we're going to be checking state, which is the variable we created at the beginning, right? See, this is how I bring things around. Cliffhangers are amazing. Okay, so how a switch statement works is you de declare its switch, you set whatever you'd like it to be. In this case, we're checking the value of state, and then you make cases for it. So let's say we wanted to ask uh, if state equals equals zero. In a normal statement, let's say we do if state equals equals zero, blah blah blah, do stuff, if state equals equals one, it's long. It's really long. It's really long. Switch statement, alright, case zero, done. That was our if statement, we're already, we're done. We're done. So we already know that we're place meeting with this instance. So what we can do now, because we have that variable, is we can do state equals t. Now the reason I'm doing this with case equals zero is that zero is the state at which we're either going to die because we run into an object and we're terrible at the game, or we're going to run into this power up and we're going to go from either a power up of zero to two or one. So in that case, because we want it to just immediately go up to whatever that power up is, then we want to make sure that state of t uh, or state is equal to the value of t, which was the power-up type right away. So we just switch to it. We don't even need to think about what type of power-up that is. It's totally random. It works great. So now we can do case one. Again, we're, we're just done. In this case, we're actually going to use an if statement. We're going to write if state is less than t. So that way, if t is equal to one, then we do not attempt to change the power up because they're already in that state. It would be a waste of variables, really. Then we can set state equal to t. So that way, if t is equal to 2, or in our case, if the power up variable is equal to 2, then we want state to go to 2 as well, from 1. Case 2 doesn't matter because it's pretty much the same thing as 1. So we can just do default now and set break. So that's actually pretty important, because that makes sure that if nothing's happening, it breaks out of the loop, and that doesn't waste computer performance then. Okay, so that's pretty much the place meeting done, and now all we're going to do is we're going to automate the state switching of the object. So in this case, we can just make a switch statement at the bottom that checks state once again, and we're going to do case 0, and we're going to set image index t equals 0, we're going to set image x scale to equal 0.5 and image y scale to equal 0.5. So what this means is that we do not need to make a smaller sprite for object player. 
when they're in the state of zero, which is like right before death, then they're at a 0 0.5 for their um, size. So they're half the size, half the width and height. Now we can do case of one. Image index is still equal to zero. Image x scale is going to equal one this time and image y scale is going to equal one this time. So this is our normal sprite, right? This is gonna be the normal size of the object. Now, if they get the two power up, then we want them to switch to image index equals one. But let's say they were already in the case zero, right? They can go immediately to it. So we do need to make sure once again that image x scale equals one and image y scale equals one. Otherwise, it might not change. Okay, so break, and then of course, once again, just default of break, so we don't have any issues with our loop, and that should be pretty much it. So pretty much everything beyond this point is power-ups. That was the tutorial. And we go ahead, and let's say, alright, awesome, we're done, right? So let's run our game. Okay, and boom. We are now the red power-up. But if we test the blue power-up, which was the one previous, nothing happens, right? Okay. So let's say we go to the blue power-up this time. Run our game again. Get a blue power-up. Oh, awesome, we're blue. But we can actually still go to the red power-up. We can't go back down, but we can go to the red power-up. If I were to go now, I'm going to make a draw event. This is just for my own pleasure. Torture you. Okay, we're going to draw some text on the screen at 64 by 64, and we're just going to make it a string of the value score, which of course we were adding to the whole time. Now just make sure you write draw self, as otherwise draw text would make sure the player does not appear on the screen, that's very important. Go ahead and run that, and now we have our score up there. Boom, 1000 points. 2,000 points. We're still getting points for touching the other power-ups. However, we do not change now because there's no point in continuing to change the player. They're already at the max power level, right? And that's pretty much how you do power-ups. You can specify any type of power-up you want in here. It does not need to be random at all. I chose random because I felt it was more interesting. Uh, however, this would allow you to make changing the p player state pretty quickly while keeping them within the same sprite. And by using image index, let's say you have to change the player's sprite all the time, right? If you just still have the uh, image index in the same order, then that allows you to have the sprites, the player's sprite change to different angles or whatever for the player's position, and it will still work perfectly. So this has been the power-up tutorial. I hope you guys have enjoyed it, and I hope that I gave you a thorough enough insight mainly on the switch statement, which is probably the coolest part of this tutorial, I feel, as it really does show you, like, you don't need that many if statements, man. If you're gonna check one variable, like, three times, why, why should you do it three times? Why not just do case zero, case one, you know, case zero, one, two? It's just easier, right? Alright, I hope you've enjoyed, and I will see you all next time on Let's Create.